Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this first uh, series of uh, the HEI webinar series on air pollution and health in East Africa. This is the first of uh, four. Um, and uh, my name is Victor Ndusi. I'm a consulting research fellow at HEI. Um, so before we begin, uh, just a few words on HEI. Um, so we are an independent uh, research institute uh, providing trusted science, uh, targeted research and analysis, uh, scientific review, um, on the right hand side, you'll see some of our products, uh, including, you know, a systematic review of uh, transport related air pollution globally. Um, we do have a global health program uh, that uh, brings you the state of global air uh, initiative through the state of global air initiative brings you uh, the state of global air report. Uh, we have some work um, across South Asia, um, Southeast Europe, uh, and just recently we did start up uh, some work in East Africa, uh, which brings us to this uh, webinar series. Um, at the far end on the top, you'll see one of our spotlight reports on uh, state of air quality and health in East Africa that we um, released just last year. Um, so before we begin, uh, just some uh, housekeeping announcements. Um, if you experience any logistical difficulties, um, please contact us using the chat box. Uh, you can turn on closed captioning for the event at the bottom of your screen um, next to the Q&A button. Um, throughout this webinar, we will reserve three minutes for short technical questions to our speakers. We do have an in 25-minute um, open discussion period where we will uh, hopefully have in-depth question at the end of both sessions. Um, uh, please submit your questions through the Q&A function um, and at the time, any time during the webinar. Uh, you can also upvote questions um, that you feel you know, need um, uh, that attention. Uh, webinar slides and recordings will be available in the coming weeks uh, through the webinar, uh, through the HEI uh, website, and below you can see the link to the website um, where all the resources for this entire series will be um, uh, availed, including, you know, presentations from our speakers. Um, so this first webinar uh, looks at, you know, um, building momentum on health studies using locally available air quality and health data. Uh, we have um, an esteemed list of presenters for you today um, who will uh, take us through some of their work, uh, both on the air quality environment side and the health data side. So to lead us through um, this uh, session, our two co-chairs, uh, Dr. Godino Pinde, who is a uh, lecturer at the University of Kenyatta University, Department of Spatial and Environmental Management. Um, he is also uh, passionate about air quality management and uh, is part of several initiatives in Kenya and across East Africa, uh, looking at improving air quality management. Um, he also, in his spare time, does a bit of work on environmental governance, climate change, uh, adaptation and mitigation, and uh, his interests are very wide in the field of environment. Uh, we also have um, Dr. Pallavi Pant um, of HEI, uh, who is the head of the Global Health Program here at HEI. Uh, she will be also co-chairing alongside uh, Dr. Godino Pinde. Um, so our agenda is um, a two-hour agenda. We'll go through the, some opening remarks on the role of uh, data in air quality management. Uh, we have two sessions split uh, within the hour. Uh, one where we look at the availability of the health and air quality data across uh, the region. Uh, and this data, is it being used? How is it being used? How has it been applied in research and several research programs um, across uh, the region? Uh, we'll have a 25 minute open discussion also uh, towards the end of the session. And hopefully we can uh, get to interact with uh, uh, the audience and participants and our speakers um, and interrogate some of the issues around data availability, usability, uh, et cetera. Um, so without further ado, I would like to hand over to our first co-chair, uh, Dr. Godwin Opinde, uh, to take us through this uh, first session. Um, Dr. Godwin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Victor, and thank you all the participants. Um, our first presenter is uh, Dr. Mwaniki, George Mwaniki. Um, Dr. George Mwaniki is the head of air quality for World Resource Institute Africa. His work actually focuses on um, 
stakeholders across the continent, including the policymakers, civil society, communities, private sector, academia. And uh, actually, it works towards improving air quality, reducing its negative impacts on health, ecosystem, and economies. So George holds a doctorate degree in atmospheric sciences from Washington State University and a master's degree in environmental engineering from University of Montana. So at this opportune time, I wish to welcome Dr. George Moniki. Welcome, George. Uh, thank you, Gordon, and, and thank you to HEI for organizing such an important uh, uh, webinar uh, where we discuss about air yeah, quality and, and data. Uh, Victor, if you can share my slides, please. Um, I, I just before we start, I think um, uh, data in air quality for most of us attending this webinar uh, do understand the need of that, uh, the need of data in air quality management. But what kind of data do we provide, and what kind of data do policymakers need? And I think uh, my my focus today will be actually to address that particular question uh, based on my experience working with various stakeholders uh, across the continent uh, and what they've been saying, uh, mainly from the policy side, but also from the science side. Um, we could go to the next slide. Yeah, um, I, I think one of the, my, my slides are actually quite pictorial, uh, so bear with me. But I, I thought of putting these two uh, planes there. Uh, one of the sectors that really knows how to use data to inform uh, their work is actually the aviation industry. If you look at the plane on your screen, it should be on the left, uh, the yellow one. Uh, that is an old 1945 airplane. Uh, most of them are not flying very high. They were prone to a couple of accidents. And if you think about the data that those pilots had access to, uh, they didn't have as much access uh, compared to the twin engine uh, you're seeing on your right. So the twin engine on your right has much more data. And because of that, the pilots are always informed on what's happening on the ground. And we will I'll ask you a couple of questions uh, about what would be your preference if you are to take a, a short two hour flight. Uh, if you might go to the next slide, Victor. Uh, this, this slide shows mainly the cockpits of the two planes. Uh, I try to make sure that they reflect the site uh, on the slides um, uh, as, as they are shared. And I would like to ask the audience, with an experienced pilot, which of these flights would you feel comfortable being on? And uh, I, I would guess most probably you'd prefer to be on the plane on your right, uh, because you know the pilot has information to make the right decisions. Uh, those equipment have been tested uh, uh, and, and the pilot knows how to use them. Uh, so for example, uh, the pilot on your right, uh, sometimes when he's flying too high or during the night, uh, sometimes he has no information whether the plane is upright or sideways or something like that. But you're sure that there is an instrument within the cockpit that tells him uh, uh, which direction the plane is, is facing. Uh, the plane also has the, some very good radar system, so you know that your priority is able to avoid any major uh, uh, storms uh, within the area. And, and you know that the pilot is also in a continuous uh, communication. Uh, on your left, the plane there also has enough dials uh, to make sure you reach where you, you, you want to, to go. Uh, but sometimes the information there is not as much uh, compared to the more modern uh, airplane. And, and I think how these uh, are dials or how this information uh, reaches the pilot is mainly influenced uh, by the various uh, studies or accident analysis uh, that the aviation industry has carried on and, and made sure that the pilots don't have enough information to control the plane. If you might go to the next slide. Uh, if you if 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 you know that uh, you have a good experience uh, uh, pilot, at which altitude uh, would you prefer these planes to go? Let's assume you are flying during the day. 
Of course, the brain that was in the 1945, you would prefer that the priority is not too high, is probably below the clouds, so that he is const constantly looking at the ground and knowing uh, what is happening down there, how far he is uh, from the ground, uh, and also knowing whether his, his plane is, is in the right, is horizontally positioned uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, so I, I would guess you'd be more comfortable for this particular plane if we are flying below the clouds because you know the pilot has access to a little bit more information, not just uh, what the dials are providing. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, yeah, if you have this uh, kind of a plane, you'll be quite uh, comfortable if this particular pilot is actually flying at by very high altitudes. Uh, where there is less turbulence, because you know, if the Navy is not able to see the ground, he has enough equipment uh, and instruments in, in his cockpit to really understand what's happening, how his instrument is performing, and how everything else uh, is moving. Uh, if you might go to the next slide. Now, I, I, I also try to look at the pilot versus the engineer. I'm guessing the instruments, most of those were made. Uh, by an engineer uh, who kind of understands aviation, but in the real sense, he does not have to attend flying flying school. He just know he just needs to make sure that uh, his instruments are giving data that is trustworthy and is useful to the pilot. Uh, the, the other thing is the pilot or the engineer must know what kind of information is useful to the pilot. And again, some of the issues that you might uh, consider avoiding is giving the pilot too much information that sometimes you get distracted uh, or, or has too many information to make the right decision. So there, there is a sweet uh, point where you give the right number of information, uh, which is necessary to make sure the pilot operates the equipment. Now, coming on the pilot side, um, the, the role of the pilot is to get you to your destination safely and on time. And he does not need to know about the mechanics of the instruments. He doesn't know how the instruments are made, how the instruments are designed. All he needs to know is the instruments are here and they're giving me accurate information. And, and the pilot is not necessary for them to be engineers to understand more about the, 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 the nitty gritties of the information. And I think this relates quite well uh, with the air quality space. Uh, I don't know how many times I have seen practitioners or people who are uh, air quality experts are giving information to policy makers. And sometimes, in fact, I think we are guilty of giving too much information. Uh, so sometimes when you talk to policy makers, they, they just want to reduce emission from a certain sector. And the kind of information we give them is uh, about emission inventories, about modeling, about various uh, pollutants in the atmosphere. Uh, and then we actually start discussing issues of uh, how much can we trust this data, what is our confidence levels, and, and those kind of discussions. And, and I think in this sense, those are discussions that should be spared for the engineer in this case, or for the researchers. Uh, the researchers should make sure that they're analyzing the data and giving the policymakers the data that they exactly need uh, to, to implement actions to reduce pollution. I, I have to share an experience uh, in Nairobi. Uh, we, were, we are doing a project, the Clean Air Catalyst. And some of the times when you're having discussions with the policymakers, uh, under the Catalyst, we wanted to do a huge uh, science work to really understand what is happening in Nairobi in terms of air pollution, uh, what are the major drivers doing the source apportionment, all those studies. Those are very good studies and they're very, very important for the engineer stroke, the researcher in this case. But the policymakers have had in the last 10, 20 years that air pollution in Nairobi is getting worse and we need to do something about it. That information by itself is it's strong enough. Uh, and when you start talking about PM 2.5 ozone, those are good uh, information and, and giving them the details about the show and all that. But really, uh, according to what I got from the policymakers, we just need to know uh, which sectors are contributing most 
and what are some of the solutions? And from that discussion we had with policymakers, then we had to tweak our project a little bit to put more resources and more time towards coming up with solutions rather than generating additional data on air pollution in the city. So it is very, very critical for, for researchers to get the information and make sure the information is trustworthy and then transmit that information in a digested way and an easy way to understand for policymakers and, and also in a way that it makes the work for policymaking easier. Uh, if you just go and say PM2.5 in Nairobi is an average of 25 microgram per meter cube. Uh, it's good information, but it's not very useful. Uh, but if you go there and say, okay, 25, and you think 40% of that is coming from transport, the other 40 from waste management, and the other 20 from households, industry, and, and those kind of things, then it's easier for policymakers to know then if we want to transform air pollution in Nairobi, the areas we need to target are vehicles and waste management. So packaging that information in a simple way that is relevant to the policymaker is quite uh, critical. If we might go to the next slide. Uh, the other thing is we have to be, uh, we have to, to, to cultivate a uh, uh, relationship with policymakers. Uh, policymakers, they, they, I, I worked in government for around five years. So I, I was in the path of receiving this data. And receiving data is not enough. I have to make sure that the person providing me this data is somebody I would consider an honest broker. He has no other interest in providing data. So we have to cultivate the relationship with policymakers. And while cultivating those relationships, we have to make sure that the policymakers take that or understand the researchers as honest, honest brokers, uh, and they're providing the information based on their findings rather than having any other uh, uh, motives, uh, independent of who sponsored uh, the project. Uh, if we might go to the next slide. Uh, so so for, uh, for, for policymakers uh, and also for researchers, we have to understand uh, the clients or the policymakers' decision-making process. Uh, as a policymaker, you are trying to balance many, many interests. You have interest from private sector, interest from, from communities, interest from uh, uh, politicians. And these interests are not do not carry the same weight. So when transmitting that data, you also have to look at, uh, to understand, have a good understanding on what kind of challenges is a policymaker uh, struggling with. And how do you then position your data to make sure that you make the work easier for the policymaker in trying to balance those uh, interests? So it is very important for researchers also to have a very good understanding on the, the power dynamics and the challenges and the acts of balancing different interests uh, for policymakers or for decision makers. You go to the next slide, please. And I, I try to look at some of the conflict of interest. Uh, these, these are people who kind of try to push certain agendas in the policy and decision. We do have the researchers. Uh, most of researchers usually have particular donors, and these donors uh, sometimes are not just pure interested in data. They have some areas that they would like to see some transformation, and they want the data to kind of build that case. Uh, for researchers also, we do care a lot about publications and making sure that publication and our data can stand a peer review process. Uh, we also have interest on in making sure that we train students and, and some also have interest to make sure that if they are on a tenure track process that they get uh, a tenure. And those are interests sometimes that conflict uh, with the decision makers' uh, interests. If, you, for example, you're trying to pursue tenor track, you really want to publish a lot and you want to really train a lot of students, which actually are not the interests for policymakers. Yeah, policymakers are more interested to see change, but but most of, most often they do respond to urgent and visible citizen demands. So if you have an informed, if the citizens are not well informed on a particular issue, then it's not likely to get the level of attention uh, that it would need. And, and this is one of the cases we are, we are noticing in Africa. Uh, citizens' awareness on air pollution is probably around 10 to 15 percent. Uh, and that means in the policy discussions or in the politics part of it, it does not appear as, as an urgent issue. 
Uh, the other thing is on the private sector. Uh, these are also people who kind of really try to push their agendas um, uh, in the decision making. And most of them, they would like to see delayed actions. Uh, and for that, they create unnecessary um, uh, uh, roadblocks uh, for, for the policymakers when they're making these decisions. And sometimes when you go to cities, especially uh, uh, in, in the developing world, uh, some of the most emitting sources are usually what we call the captured spaces. They have a huge political organization that do have a lot of political power. And therefore, it's very, very important to make sure that if you're proposing something to the policymaker, uh, that also you have considered issues of some of these captured spaces. And maybe it's, it's time to start thinking about a multidisciplinary approach uh, to transforming uh, air quality uh, in Africa. If you might go to the next slide. Uh, so air, air quality research and mostly any other research should be uh, driven by needs. Uh, most of the research we are seeing uh, across the continent, they're mostly driven by the needs for the, the researchers and also for the donors, but nobody really talks to the policymakers and ask them, what do you want to understand better uh, in your city uh, about air pollution? And, and, I, and I think that is where we do miss the mark, because if the, 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 the research is driven by interest of the donor or the researcher, uh, sometimes that interest might conflict with the policymaker uh, interest, and therefore you might not get uh, the kind of action that you'd want to see on the ground. If we go to the next slide. Yeah, and uh, I stop there. And, uh, I hope that was useful and I give it back to the chair. Thank you very much, George. Uh, that's, that's an interesting uh, analogy of uh, the engineer versus the pilot and trying to navigate through the spaces in terms of policy, research, and different stakeholders in air quality. And so before we move to the next presenter, George, uh, maybe I have a question for you. Um, would you consider uh, as the greatest, what do you consider the greatest challenge and the opportunities when you're filling the existing data gap across region, um, particularly that now involved in uh, this kind of project and several other projects, airport projects before, George? Um, the, in the air quality space in Africa, there is a, a lot of opportunities for generating more data, but also there is a lot of opportunity of transforming the emitting sectors. And, and I think uh, we should try to build hybrids of, for example, transport sector saying this is the most emitting source in most of our cities. And transforming that, then you look at what are some of the available opportunities. I, I think, for example, the case for Africa pushing for vehicle emission standards is a good idea, but even a better idea is helping Africa uh, leapfrog uh, from internal combustion engines straight to electric uh, vehicles. As most of the continent moves on very uh, energy is, is generated from renewable sources. So also giving uh, policymakers those kind of options and, and actually doing some level of analysis of how those options would look like. Um, those are areas that are wide open. Uh, and I think uh, the air quality practitioners sh should take advantage of that. Oh, that, that's great, George. Uh, maybe just a follow up to that. And for our participants, we'll have a Q&A session. So please um, type your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, George, maybe the last one before we move to our next presenter. Um, we have competing interests and priori priorities. Uh, from your opinion, what would you consider good enough data so that you can able to prioritize air pollution? Um, I, I think even the interested parties and all those people who try to build your blocks, they do understand that they bleed the same way and they're exposed to the same challenges. Um, uh, I'll give an example of how we are approaching these under the Catalyst project. It is actually building coalition which includes those interested parties. They do need to understand also what kind of harm uh, they're exposing themselves and the community, and actually how transitioning to better and cleaner technologies would actually improve on their bottom line. I, I, I think when you talk to people and tell them, this is affecting your health in these and these ways, and these old technologies are, um, are more expensive than the technology available in the market, uh, then you do see a lot of 
uh, a change of heart from the interested parties. And, and I think Nairobi, for example, is one of those cities when you talk to industries, they actually tell you, I don't think you are going hard enough on us. <laughs> I think we can do much better. So, so once they do have a good understanding, they're more willing to participate and work with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. George. And for our participants, just chatting your questions. Dr. George is still available. Um, I'd wish to move to our next presenter. And uh, to introduce our presenter, our presenter is Dr. Anderson. Um, he's a program leader for natural resource and ecosystems at Stockholm Environmental Institute, Africa. Anderson has worked in several African countries and has 16 years of experience in climate and energy policy research, energy system modeling, sectoral decarbonization, sustainable agriculture and forest management, market and value chain analysis, as well as innovation and entrepreneurship. He holds a PhD in environmental and natural resource management from Brandenburg and, um, and there's a master's degree in business administration from Simon Fraser University in Canada. So this time I'd wish to welcome Dr. Anderson to lead us through his presentation. Dr. Anderson, welcome. Thank you very much, Godwin. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, yes, I can. Maybe you put it on full, full, uh, full presentation mode. Please. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's okay. All right. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, good day to everybody. So as I indicated, I'm Anderson Kibula from the Stockholm Environment Institute in based in Nairobi. So today I'll be talking about uh, leveraging shared knowledge, you know, focusing on the regional and national air quality monitoring programs in the in across Africa. So basically, um, I'm going to share a project that you are working in the collaboration with UNEP. It's called uh, Consortium for Air Quality Data in Africa. So what we are trying to do here is to um, try to aggregate all the uh, sensors that have been installed in all the major cities in Africa into one uh, platform, centralized platform that could be accessible to the general public as well as policymakers. So just a bit of a background. Uh, we all know that you know um, there's a growing concern with regards to air pollution in the in Africa, and the rising air pollution in many major cities has actually led to you know a lot of premature deaths, you know, in most African uh, cities and countries. So um, currently, there is though you know this uh, there's high rate of you know uh, air pollution, uh, poor air quality, as well as high you know premature death attributed to uh, to air pollution. Despite all these challenges, many African uh, countries and cities have very poor or no air quality management inf infrastructure. So what we are trying to do in this project, as I mentioned earlier, is to see how to fill this gap by installing you know, low cost air quality sensors across major cities in Africa, and then collecting that data and bringing it into one platform that is accessible online by the public as well as policymakers. So we are following a UNEP's integrated approach, which of course, seek to uh, integrate, you know, satellite, uh, you know, data, ground monitoring, as well as, uh, you know, uh, modeling. So all these three approach, uh, approaches, that's what we are uh, looking at, to have a very comprehensive view with regards to, you know, air quality across all the major cities that we are working, working in. 
This are uh, a map of uh, some of the cities that we are engaging. We have Dakar with two sensors, Kampala in, uh, in Uganda, Kenya. We have Idem Nairobi, Nakuru, Eldoret, Djibouti, four of them. Uh, this is mostly uh, uh, this in, in Ethiopia. 11 sensors have been deployed in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, as well as in the Zam. So these are some of the key, you know, uh, cities where we've actually deployed most of these sensors, of which we are looking forward to, you know, expanding our network together with other partners across uh, the continent. So uh, going now to the first case study, which is Dar es Salaam, I'll present to you, uh, Two, you know, two approaches uh, that we normally use. The first one is using satellite data to have sort of a, an overview of, you know, pollution across, you know, a defined area that we are interested in. And in this case, uh, we're looking at Dar es Salaam. As you can see, for the case of uh, nitrogen dioxide, it is very high. The red. Uh, color shows that uh, that uh, is, is quite high, this uh, particular areas, that's uh, the western, central west, which of course, you know, the main uh, CBD area of uh, of, uh, of uh, Dar es Salaam. So this actually, you know, has remained constant over the years between 2018 up to 2020. But as you can see, as time goes on, you know, the concentration, you know, uh, reduces, uh, especially. So it shows that uh, the Islam uh, City Council has been taking some measures to actually reduce, you know, air pollution in the city. So in terms of uh, the time series, again, for the satellite data, we see that uh, as time goes on from, 20, uh, from 2000, there's really like a, a big spike, you know, going up to 2020. And uh, after uh, 2020, when uh, I believe uh, 2020, that was the second year of COVID, we start seeing you know, sort of um, a decline in air pollution because of the lockdown. That was for the case of PM 2.5. And uh, for black carbon as well, we have some sort of uh, a similar trend, an increase in the black carbon concentration from 2000 right up to 2020. The second approach that we, after doing this satellite uh, observation, the next you know, method was to actually install sensors to do some sort of uh, ground measurement to get some sort of you know, um, empirical data on the ground. And these are some of the uh, locations that, some of, that these sensors are actually have actually been deployed in Dar es Salaam. So with regards to the ground sensors, uh, right now we are just giving an overview, you know, with the, uh, regarding the remote uh, sense data as well as the uh, ground monitoring. The next step would not, be, would not be to triangulate these two data to see, you know, some sort of correlation and uh, other, you know, uh, variance analysis that uh, you know will come up from it, but at this point in time, we are just giving an overview, which of course, as you can see here, for the PM uh, two point five, you see there's a peak, you know, um, mostly in the evenings, in the you know, in the this Kigamboni municipality in Dar es Salaam, so it starts very uh, slowly in the morning, known rising up and then uh, again in the evening or after uh, 6 six thirty, we start finding peak. I think those are the uh, peak time whereby people are either coming back from work or back from, from businesses or from the activities in town. Then looking at the, uh, the, hourly, the hourly figure, we realize that uh, most of it, as I said earlier, is after you know six thirty, and uh, for the uh, monthly, it is quite it was quite high in the in August, 
This data was actually taken between uh, June and September, going down right up to December. So the, the peak, you know, was in August. And in terms of, uh, you know, week, uh, the weekdays, we realized that, you know, as we move right up to the middle of the week, Wednesdays and Thursdays, going up to Friday, right up to Sunday, we have some stuff uh, a spike in the PM 2.5 and PM 10 in this particular municipality. Going down to Nairobi, which I believe we are all familiar with, if we look at the satellite data for nitrogen dioxide, we see that it's quite concentrated as well uh, as with the case in the slum in the central west, which of course in the Nairobi does this CBD. And uh, it has some hassle of remain you no know, constant between 2018 and 2020. So we are now working with the city of Nairobi to put in place measures to see how to uh, mitigate you know, air pollution from the different sources across the city. And uh, looking at the time series, again, as the case with uh, Dar es Salaam, there was a spike beginning uh, in the year 2000, going up to 2010 was also, you know, uh, the peak. Then uh, around 2019, there was also a spike by 2020, when the COVID came, that was the second uh, year of COVID, we start having a decline. And as you can see, you know, on the uh, the graph here at the bottom, that that's uh, the straight COVID lockdown period. And as you can see there, you know, the concentration of PM 2.5 from black carbon was really, really low. These are the different sites in Nairobi that uh, we've installed uh, most of our sensors that are providing data now into the uh, centralized uh, data management system. And as we can see here, you know, in terms of the ground measurement, uh, looking at PM 2.5, this the NIVAS uh, location at Westland, there's a peak, you know, mostly uh, as you can see here on Thursday, uh, during the week and for PM uh, 2.5 hourly again um, almost similar to what we we uh, we found in the Islam you know around uh, 6 6 p.m or just close to 6 uh, 6 p.m that's when you have peak in both PM 2.5 and PM uh, 10 and this data was actually collected uh, between uh, March and April, March, April, and May. So the peak, you know, for the three months was actually in May. Then looking now at the weekdays, we found that, you know, from Monday to Wednesday, uh, between PM 2.5 and PM 10, you know, they are just, uh, they are uh, just, you know, beginning to you know to to pick up and then going right up to thursday that's where we really found you know the highest you know uh pm to perform pm uh, 10 concentrations uh basically we are still trying to figure out uh why this particular day thursday and after that then it starts uh going down but again as you can see uh pm 10 for all of for all the three scenario, hourly, monthly, and weekly, are quite higher than the PM 2.5. So again, um, we are also looking at presenting the data, you know, in a in a user friendly manner, in terms of you know um, how in terms of an index to show you know the general population, the air quality index for a particular day. So as you can see here. The green highlights that you know the air quality is good. Um, light blue is excellent, yellow is moderate, and red is quite red is unhealthy. So for this particular month, August in twenty twenty in twenty twenty two, 
most of the days, you know, we found that uh, it was, uh, you know, quite, quite healthy. And uh, many of them was quite, uh, many of the days were quite excellent, you know, for, you know, for, for those who are doing, I mean, activities or for athletics, who are, these are for the uh, Nando Stadium. So for all the athletes who are like, coming there to do whatever they are doing in terms of sporting activities, then, you know, before going there, they have this, uh, this graph displayed on the billboard to show them exactly the air quality at that particular location. So they, they know exactly what, you know, they are breathing at a particular point in time. So moving forward to Addis Abeba, I must admit here that for Addis, uh, we are facing some, some challenges there because uh, mo most of the air quality sensors that we, we installed are now uh, on, they are not really functioning at, current, uh, at the present moment. So we are looking at ways to see how we could train some sort of, uh, you know, local technicians, to, to maintain them so that they are actually providing you know, data on a regular uh, interval. Because if they are not provided you know, on a regular interval, we'll be able to make sort of meaningful analysis. And that's why for this, I will not be able to present some sort of uh, data on the ground monitoring because we are still trying to get some sort of uh, quality data there. But in case of the uh, satellite data, we have that for the uh, nitrogen dioxide and uh, we observed that you know towards uh, the west, the western part of Addis, that's where you have very high levels of uh, nitrogen dioxide, and uh, very low you know towards the, the eastern the eastern uh, area. So this just shows that uh, if policymakers have to take intervention, this is just a visual to show them that you know they have to focus their attention more on the western part of it. And in those in that uh, western part, then that's where we have to focus, you know, in terms of installing our sensors to find out exactly where those constitutions are coming from. Yeah, are they coming from, you know, uh, transport? We look at uh, different, you know, uh, land use, land usage, uh, industrial areas. Put our sensors there just to figure out exactly where this uh, pollution is coming from. So, um, with that in mind. I will uh, want to thank you for your attention and look forward to any question or comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anderson. Um, uh, participants, in the interest of time, I'd want to have back and back to back presentation so that we have some good time for Q and A. And because of that, now I wish to welcome uh, Kanyeva and maybe just introduce Kanyeva. Uh, Dr. Kanyeva Muindi is an air quality researcher um, within the Humanization and Wellbeing Unit at the African Population and Health Research Center. She has worked on various projects addressing the cause and, I mean, causes, cause and consequences of urbanization in sub Saharan Africa and has vast experience working with urban informal settlements. She's passionate about air quality and is especially interested in perceptions of exposure to air pollution, their effects on health and building on those to inform policy and actions for improved health and well-being. So Kanyeva holds a PhD in epidemiology and public health from Mayer University Sweden and a master's degree in epidemiology from the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. So this opportunity time, I want to welcome Kanyeva. Kanyeva, take the floor. Uh, thank you, Godwin. Um, our previous presenters have uh, given us a bit about um, air quality data. And uh, one of the biggest challenges that we are facing, probably this applies to Kenya, but I think also across Africa, we are having quite a limited amount of uh, data that shows what air pollution is doing to human health. And um, my presentation today is really exploring what we could, where we could start to probably utilize existing systems and data that uh, that is collected uh, periodically 
uh, across Africa and also in other parts of the world through the demographic surveillance system. Um, just to start uh, to, to explore what uh, the health consequences of exposure are, while we put in order probably better studies that can actually give us clearer understandings of um, the burden of air pollution on health across Africa. And so this is the outline of my brief presentation. Uh, let's move to the next uh, slide, uh, Victor. So I begin with uh, exploring what uh, health and demographic surveillance systems are. And these are uh, studies that are, that are usually held within a very limited areas, so small area studies with populations that are quite uh, delineated in terms of uh, geography. So if I say I'm going to cover, in Kenya, we usually use the sublocation location. I don't know whether that's the same, maybe a ward in other areas. So if a ward is what you want to define as your study area, which is the demographic surveillance area, DSA, then that is what defines your HDSS. And then you begin your regular surveillance. For example, in uh, the Nairobi Urban Health uh, Demographic Surveillance System, we have been doing updates every four months. Others usually do it once every year. It's, it's quite um, dependent on many, many uh, factors. But for Nairobi, we considered the turnover of slum populations. People move quite a lot. And so we were missing quite, um, would miss quite a lot of information if we were to do it once every year. So you, it could stretch to once a year for maybe rural or stable populations, but or, uh, more regular for mobile populations like um, we find in slums. And uh, initially the HDSS uh, sites were, were, were um, organized under the umbrella of in-depth, uh, which is um, a network of HDSSs across the world that wanted to standardize methodologies so that we could have comparable data sets. Initially, people were just doing what they wanted to do, but then uh, uh, people came together and thought we were losing a little bit of uh, comparison because if, if we have different methods for the same study, then you can't really compare. So they were put together under the in-depth uh, umbrella. And uh, this information that I'm sharing is based on the 2018 update. In-depth became a little bit um, inactive, but I understand that it's now coming back again. So we expect to see probably better, better things coming from the in-depth site. But we can see the systems or the sites that are quite a, a large number. Uh, across Africa, we have over 40 sites. This uh, up to 2018, these were the 37 member sites that were registered under INDEP, but associate sites were four across Africa. I think we've more newer sites that were, were probably started in the 2020s or late, uh, yeah, after 2018. So the number could be more than 41 as, as indicated here. In Asia, we have 11 member sites and two associate sites, while in Oceania, we have one member site and one associate site. So we can see the geographical cover coverage of these sites is quite um, an opportunity for people to actually look at different cultures, different practices, do different human behavior, and different urbanization rates, different uh, usage of motor vehicles or other, uh, other behaviors that actually contribute to air pollution and see what uh, the data is saying about health. Next uh, slide. And so this map just gives a glimpse of where we where the sites are, and we can see Africa has a lot of uh, sites. And this was actually um, motivated by the lack of uh, vital registration um, statistics for most um, uh, populations across Africa. I think vital registrations were mo mostly uh, fully or almost fully covered within urban areas, and then. You find that in rural areas, people don't even have birth certificates. When people die, don't, they don't have a death certificate. And so these sites were actually like um, a solution to kind of address the gap in vital registration. But they evolved again with infectious diseases coming along, other challenges that were, were quite particular to a certain country. And then with uh, the advent of um, the double, double burden of malnutrition or infectious disease and, and uh, NCDs or 
uh, non-communicable diseases, then we see that sites have been evolving and addressing uh, quite a, a range of um, disease burdens and other issues that um, affect the African um, health. And uh, we also have quite a number of them involved in um, clinical trials of vaccines. And yeah, so it, it, they're, they're, they're actually like what we call living labs that you can layer on any study that you want to to add on to the basic uh, demographic surveillance data so that you can explore uh, the outcomes that you are interested in. Next slide. So this is just a bit of history, just to show the, the potential that could actually be, we, we could reap from these uh, HDSS sites. And uh, the oldest in Africa is the Gwembe site in uh, Zambia that was st started in the late 50s. So that's someone, if someone was, uh, was registered and followed up, since 1956, we could already be having almost 70 years of data on, on such individuals. And so that was started to assess the impact of like Cariba on communities. It was very social, social science uh, oriented, nothing health, but they layered on other aspects of health as time went on. Then we have uh, the Nyahas uh, site in Senegal uh, following and for Afeni in the 80s, and Butajira in the 80s as well. In Kenya, I think we started in the 2000s, probably, um, early 2000s, uh, when we started with um, uh, Kisumu and Nairobi uh, DSS site. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many others that have come up as well. And the sites collect quite routine data, like uh, demographic data, so age, sex, uh, births, deaths, um, uh, we also look at illnesses, which you could define it dependent on the researchers within the center. So you could look at um, cause of death uh, using the verbal autopsy, where we interview the caretaker of a sick person until the time they die. And then um, three physicians will look at what has been written and come to an agreement about the cause of death. And that is taken as a um, an indicative cause of death in the absence of an, uh, an actual autopsy report from a medical uh, facility, a health facility. Then we also have socioeconomic data, including housing and access to linked services such as water and sanitation and hygiene services, uh, energy, etc. Uh, we also have uh, data on movements, which could be both internal, like change of uh, housing within within the uh, demographic surveillance area or actual out migrations to other areas and probably return migrations. So we capture all that uh, within the HDSS as, as routine data. And now I'll present the case study for the urban um, health and demographic surveillance site for Nairobi, which was started in 2000, covering two slums in, in, uh, in the city of Nairobi. So Korogosho, which uh, borders the municipal dam site uh, in, near Dandora, and Viwandani, which in Swahili uh, just means industrial area. So it's actually behind the, the red, the red, um, is it red? The maroon colored uh, uh, structures are the industries. So the dark side is the, the community, the slum community of Viwandani. So they are just next to, both of them are, are next to quite highly polluting um, Process. Um, so industries are always on 24 hours. The dam site is also on 24 hours with a lot of smoke. And um, yeah, implications for their health. Um, for Nairobi data, we have, this is just a glimpse that there's quite a lot of data that is um, collected. So I just highlighted what could actually be used for linking to, to air pollution. So child health. Um, ignore the immunization and the diarrhea diseases. So respiratory illnesses uh, could actually offer an opportunity for this team uh, and other interested researchers to look at uh, whether or the contribution of air pollution, both in the house and outdoors, to um, the burden of uh, respiratory illnesses among children. We also have maternal health outcomes. So we look at pregnancies and the birth of, uh, of children. So someone could actually also recruit a cohort of children born and or during pregnancy and 
uh, follow up until a certain age and see how the maternal outcome uh, maternal outcomes including uh, neonatal age, uh, health is impacted by air pollution then we also have uh, the cvd study the cardiovascular outcome study that was a one of um, nested study on the dss but it still has an opportunity to actually look at whether the same measurements that were done could actually be carried out with uh, an exposure assessment to air pollution. Currently, the, we have the AWIGEN study, which is a multi-site um, study that looks at um, genomic and environmental risk factors for cardiometabolic diseases in South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, Burkina Faso. Uh, they are, I think they've done the first phase, but with a possibility of extending with um, availability of funding. So that's also a study that someone could layer on to look at uh, air pollution. Um, I'm presenting this just to show what we collect as causes of death, um, um, uh, disaggregated by age. So for under five year olds, we see that respiratory tract infections are quite um, the highest cause of death among both males and females. And um, infectious diseases uh, like HIV, meningitis. Um, my interest would be in the respiratory infections to just look at what that, uh, how that links with the uh, environmental exposures. And also some of the injuries could be due to burns. Okay, um, I, I stray to in, um, cooking energy and so, much as it's not linked to air pollution, it's associated with a source of air pollution. Is, um, we've seen that uh, most children will actually burn from maybe kerosene stoves that are exploding or uh, accidentally touching a hot surface that uh, is being, uh, that they're exposed to within the kitchen. And for most slum households, for those who might not have uh, interacted with slum household, it's just a single room that is um, everything. So it's your bedroom and it's your kitchen. So there's really not much space for babies who are crawling around to avoid getting these injuries. Next slide. Um, just to mention that for, I skipped the 15 plus, um, the 15 to 59 age group, because most of the, uh, the, the biggest causes of injury, especially among males, was injuries. So gunshots and maybe gang-related uh, violence and road accidents. Uh, and I would, I'd wanted to present the 60 plus to actually look at um, the biggest cause of death among them is tuberculosis and cardiovascular diseases, um, which is quite interesting when you look at the females. The females for tuberculosis, which is a brown colored bar, and um, also for males in Korogosho, it's for me, the, for the females, I was quite curious whether there could be an, a play of um, household air pollution to predisposing them to tuberculosis. Uh, I've seen some research that has linked a bit of uh, TB cases to air pollution, so worth investigating. But also the cardiovascular um, burden is, is quite high, especially for Korogosho females. And um, this includes, would include um, probably uh, hypertension, heart disease. And um, with all the upcoming or the research that, that is coming out with uh, uh, implication of uh, exposure to air pollution on uh, cardiovascular health, it would be quite interesting to tease out some of these relationships. We do not have quite a lot of COPD, but it could also be uh, an error in recording of um, the information that we get from caregivers who are usually just family members with no medical training. So they might give quite ambiguous uh, symptoms and probably leads the diagnosis in, in a different direction. This other group is really just um, several causes of death that are put together. And so 
we might not focus on that as much as uh, the actual identified um, causes of death. Uh, next. And so from looking at what HDSS sites do and what they are, they are still doing, uh, we could say that there are some opportunities for, for researchers to actually begin looking at the health um, implications of exposure to air pollution, because that has not really been highlighted as much as it should. It's not growing at the same pace with the, uh, the assessment of uh, air pollution. And so we have some of, um, most HDSS sites will have health data to a certain degree. And I think some analysis could be done and then for air pollution exposure, because we really don't, they, most sites will not be having any time series data on, on air pollution. Then probably uh, a beginning point could be using of satellite um, air pollution data, plus uh, maybe some proxies for, for air pollution like fuel types that are used in the households, but then we miss out on the ambient because there's, there's really no, we don't collect much about um, the general environment of um, surrounding the, 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 the communities. But I, I think satellite air pollution data could fill that, um, that gap for now. Then we could also think of collaborating with special interest groups or networks. For example, those who are looking at CVD, the Awigen team, the African Non-Communicable Disease Longitudinal Data Alliance. There is also Inspire Network that is bringing together all, all sites that are looking, that are collecting longitudinal data on anything. So it's up to interested researchers to actually sift what uh, members of the the Inspire Network are, are really interested in and reach out to them and uh, plan to work together. In the longer term, I would think um, proposing a network on air pollution and health that uh, targets uh, interested HDSS sites would actually really be a, a good step forward. Although this may need uh, fundraising, but I know most DSS sites uh, have researchers, excellent researchers who are willing to put in the work to do the fundraising and run with the, with the air pollution and health work. Uh, next slide. Uh, so my final thoughts on HDSS is um, a tool to actually uh, start looking at uh, air pollution work and, and health. We have uh, opportunities for in-country multi-site um, studies, which, which will give a good, um, a good representation of the country because as I said, most of these uh, HDSS sites are small areas, so you might not really uh, generalize the findings to bigger, bigger chunks of the country, but because most of the sites are not uh, located in one area, like in Kenya, we have the coastal region represented, the Western region represented and Nairobi, then you can actually draw a little bit of um, a country picture. Um, then we also have multi-country collaborations possible. As I've shown, we have over 40 sites in Africa. We can, we can look at anything across uh, different uh, Francophone, Lusophone, and Anglophone countries. Um, life course approach is also quite in, uh, possible because as I said, HDSS covers the entire population from conception to death. So you can actually study uh, before, before conception all the way to, to the end of life uh, where possible uh, or up to a certain age, depending on, on available funding. And for now, we may only need to collect a more refined exposure data, like installing of monitors or giving people wearables, um, so that you can get uh, better air quality data than the satellite data, and then possibly add an additional objective measure of health outcomes, because some of the health outcomes are really not collected with air, air pollution exposure in mind. Then the other thing is uh, routine HDSS data exists for most control variables. So you'll only need to collect a very small thing and it will not be a big burden to much HDSS sites. And if I recall, we had we had actually started a group on indoor air pollution, but I think it did not really take off. So probably a proposal to the uh, site leads would actually be welcome. 
and it can expand to different directions, including climate change and health. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kaniva. Thank you for your presentation. Um, participants, we would now want to move to Q&A segment. And um, to start us off, we had two presenters. We had Anderson and we had Kaniva. So we are fielding the first questions to uh, Anderson. And Anderson, there's a question. Anderson, are you online? Let me just get a cue from you. Yes. Anderson? Okay, thank you. So there's a question from Pamela, who is a PhD student, and he would want to inquire the kind of gadgets that you're installing for ground-based monitoring in the city, and also if that gadget can measure indoor air quality. That's from Pamela. And then the second question would be from Collins Gameli, who, of course, is acknowledging your presentation as nice, and uh, is uh, inquiring what are the source of PM 10 data. So maybe you can take those two first. Anderson? Yes, so um, we mostly use um, uh, purple air for the uh, for the uh, ground-based uh, monitoring in, co in addition to other type of sensors. Uh, but uh, yeah, in terms of using it for indoor, uh, they are not really adapted for indoor, they're mostly for outdoor. So you cannot just take an outdoor uh, sensor and put indoors. It might not be that effective because uh, indoor sensors are, are, are specifically designed for that particular purpose. Thank you. Then, Thank uh, you. Mm -hmm. yes. Go on. Now I'm done with that question. Yes. So the second question was from Collins. The sources of PM10 data. Yeah, um, all of them, they were actually, you know, um, ground monitoring. Okay. And the next set of questions to Kanyeva. There's a question from, uh, sorry, um, one participant who is, uh, um, that is Eric. Yeah, trying to find out if we have, or not right, yeah. If you have DSS sites in India, would you respond to that, Kaniva? Uh, thank you. Yes, India has, uh, I think, three DSS sites, if I'm not wrong. Uh, yeah, if, uh, the uh, the person asking the question is interested in an introduction, I could I could reach they could reach out and uh, and make the introduction. Thank you. Okay. So can you the studies on health effects of air pollution in East Africa? They actually short, short term. Um, maybe you tease out briefly some of the opportunities for DSSs that can be offered for for studies in investigating those long term health effects. What are some of those opportunities? Yeah, thank you, Godwin. Uh, as I said, uh, HDSS sites are quite uh, long term in terms of. They are set up to actually fill in a gap in, um, in uh, some some of the vital statistics, plus also other health uh, measurements, like or taking part in vaccine trials, which are actually quite long term. And so, considering that uh, most HDSS sites in Africa are actually twenty years plus, then the opportunity has actually been missed, I would say, uh, because we we could actually have already had data that has covered maybe let's say 10, 10 years at the minimum uh, uh, since the, I would say air pollution and health uh, work has not really been th that old in Africa. So I wouldn't say the one day DSS site would have actually looked at air pollution, but considering when it started becoming a trending um, topic, then I think we'd already be having 10 plus years of monitoring. And I think what it would take is uh, speaking with the researchers within those sites, because most of them are actually attached to a research institution or a university. And then having discussions on how to fundraise probably to, to, to put in the monitors. And then you start churning the data and follow up these cohorts that you are following from birth 
to old age or to death and then see what outcomes uh, you are getting. And there's also some link to some health facilities where you can actually use the DHIS uh, data to actually see what, what health um, outcomes are, are coming from the community that is being followed. For example, the Kilifi DSS site is connected to a health, health center. And so most of the people who are admitted to those hospitals come from the same HDSS site and you can actually link the records and see clearly what is happening to people. Looking at their personal exposures plus the ambient um, air quality and then see the outcome from childhood to old age. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kanyiba. Uh, maybe just a follow up. There's someone who's interested to know whether they uh, there's biomonitoring studies happening in the DHSS, DHSS sites. Would you be aware about that? Whether there, are, there is air quality monitoring? No, Sorry. bio. Sorry, it's bio. Sorry, I lost that. It's bio monitoring. And it's giving example of urine and many other. Uh, those uh, those are usually not part of the regular DSS data, but uh, when you have a nested study, like if you write a proposal, get funded, and you want to utilize the DSS uh, sample, then you actually just uh, build it on the population that you already have a baseline on, and then you can actually do the testing. So I would say like the AWIGEN and the the hereditary, the Africa hereditary study where they were looking at uh, genomic and genomic um, structure of the African population plus the Awigen study that I, I highlighted that was looking at genomics plus environmental risk factors for cardiometabolic uh, health is actually was actually testing blood and urine samples, but th those are usually not routine, so you will not find it as part of the standard HDSS dataset. Thank you, thank you very much, Kanyuba. And so maybe the final round to Anderson. There is um, a, a question or a request that if you would share the data sources of satellite data sets that you used. And then also there's an interested collaborator within the chat. Maybe you can check that later on. Maybe respond to the data sets, satellite data sets. Question. Anderson, are you there? Yes, definitely. That's uh, you know, an open access data that uh, that we can share. It's not like uh, you know, it's not ground measurement where we need to do sort of synthesis and then uh, produce report before we start sharing the data. So that one, if the uh, that uh, person can uh, send me an email, then uh, I can take it from there. Yeah, and actually, you can pick the, the email. His email is already in the chat. So thank you very much, participants. Thank you, George. Thank you, Anderson. And thank you, Kanyeva, for your presentation. We are moving to the next segment of our presentation. And so I want to hand over this to my co-chair, Pallavi. So Pallavi, the pleasure is all yours. Thank you so much, Godwin. And thank you to all of the speakers. Uh, I think we're off to an excellent start with a lot of interesting ideas and, and questions. And in the next um, 30 minutes or so, we will hear from a couple of other colleagues who are thinking specifically about these data that may be getting generated and also how we can use them to look at uh, understanding the potential health impact. Um, so our first speaker in the second part of the webinar is uh, Priscilla Adong, and we're really excited to have her here with us. She's currently a data scientist with Airpool. Um, at Makerere University, where she is focusing on building and validating and deploying these sensors and also um, building predictive air quality models. So expanding on some of what Anderson just talked about. Um, she has a master's degree in data communications and software engineering, uh, and also a bachelor's degree in computer science from Makerere University. And she is an excellent programmer and researcher um, who is interested and passionate about taking the data and information and making it useful and relevant for impact. So going back to the point that George was making earlier um, during the session, so Priscilla, 
the floor is yours, welcome. Uh, thank you, Pallavi, for the great introduction and hello everyone from wherever you are. So for today, I will be talking about quality assurance of air quality data and focusing on AirCo as a case study, like basically how do we do this at AirCo. Um, so uh, before I get into it, like, first of all, why is quality assurance important? Why is this necessary? So as you may have already seen from the previous presenters, this air quality data is actually used to make some important analysis and could actually inform policy that have significant impact in how we do things or the lives of people. So we need to have a certain level of confidence in the data that we use to, to make these decisions. And quality assurance allows us to, to improve or maintain the accuracy of air quality data, ensure consistency of the measurements, minimize measurement errors, and thus ensure data reliability in general. So that when you're using this data, you are very confident of the quality of the data, you know the quality of the data you're using, and that's your confidence in your decision. So we have several quality assurance procedures at ERCO, and they start right from the lab, like we first, before we even get to looking at the data itself, we look at the device that is measuring this, this data. So in the lab, we do test, we do check the, the components. So we have low cost monitors that we assemble in our lab at Macquarie University. And we have to check, say, the individual components of this of these uh, monitors. And we after they they have been tested and they have passed the check, of course, we do have like performance evaluation metrics that we follow to to test like various performance, sorry, metrics and like how it performs, say the, the correlation, the R score and ETC. Uh, so once they pass this check, we assemble the monitor and the monitors you see in the picture, it's like there are several monitors on a rack and these are usually collocated before they are taken outside um, in the lab setting to just to do like a final check of so they do read some, but the, the monitors are working and reading these values and sending them to the cloud. So we check this data to make sure, like in, to make sure and compare them again is say a device of known performance and see how the different devices compare. Next slide, please. So the graph shows uh, an example of like the data we plotted from the co-located devices in the lab environment. As you can see, most of them, most of the devices that were co-located were reading almost the same value except one. And of course, basically when you see something like this, the device that is malfunctioning is usually recalled for either repaired or the components are discarded or replaced. Next slide, please. So once we are done with the lab testing, we've assembled the device and we, we know it's working correctly, or the components are doing what they're supposed to be doing, they are collocated with a reference grade monitor, usually at one of our collocation sites. And we do check the readings from the sensors as well. We compare the sensors against each other, like a local sensor versus a local sensor, and then a local sensor versus a reference grade monitor. And we do check the, the readings, we compare the readings between the different devices to make sure that the values or following the performance metrics, matrices that we use, are, we make sure they are within the acceptable ranges. And yeah, once we do that, well, of course now we know, we have, like I said, the thresholds and we know what are maybe a device prior to calibration would like the, the data would look like maybe in comparison with the reference grade monitor. And once they are, uh, they pass the check, uh, they are now deployed in their final deployment environment, which could be anywhere on the continent of Africa. Next slide, please. So at the moment, we have quite a number of devices deployed, uh, over 200 low-cost monitors across Africa. So it is not possible for us to, to like 
you look uh go keep checking on an individual device every now and then so we have a way to monitor to continue monitoring the device performance remotely and so when the device sends data or if it doesn't that can also tell us something we are able to tell using that data that the device is continuing to work correctly so for instance if you look at the map you do have of course the colors do mean something blue is is online gray is offline um the green is has already been maintained and red is due for maintenance and then we also do monitor the sensor correlation between the two sensors that are in each monitor so each each of our monitors have two air quality sensors and the the main purpose is basically for monitoring the performance so if one drips then you can tell that yeah something is going wrong the ideally the correlation between these two sensors is supposed to be above 0 0.9. Next slide, please. So once we are done with the device checks and we have the device um, plugged into our online platform and we can monitor this like remotely, of course, now we are looking at the data. The device has been deployed to collect data. We have several on our network, including airco monitors and um, monitors of partners, and then reference grade monitors as well. So we we the data is streamed to our online platform. Uh, the data is pre-processed and stored, then calibrated hourly, and then the calibrated data can then be used for additional analytics modeling or shared through our various TikTok platforms, including the analytics platform accessible like via the website, a mobile app or via the API. So um, the next slides, I'm going to sort of break down that entire process. So we have, like I mentioned, several devices on our network. We do have the, the AirCo Locos monitors. We have the reference grade monitors for AirCo and for partners, including US embassies across the continent and UNEP, um, and then low-cost low monitors of other partners. So what we have done is we have found a way to stream all this data through the GSM network onto like one, one platform. So it makes it easy to do, like the, the when the process is automated, it's easier to, to work with the data, to clean the data and share the data in a timely manner. Um, uh, compared to when you'd say you would download it physically, maybe using a flash disk or something like that, which sometimes we have to do because maybe if the network is off, then once in a while we may need to use a flash disk, but this sort of delays some of the analysis. Um, we also use weather data a lot when we are analyzing air quality trends in a region. So weather data is some of the key data that we use. Uh, or data that we you would we would have on our platform, and this is usually streamed through via an API from Tahmo or accessed via CSP from the Met Office, and then of course satellite data is an important uh, other source of data that we are looking at currently and trying to integrate into our platform. Next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so once the data is, all this data has been streamed, we now do what we call the pre-processing. And this is like, it involves doing preliminary checks to check the accuracy of the data, basically how correct is this data? Do we have any outliers, any readings that don't make sense are discarded? It could be readings above the known range or below the known range. Uh, it could be, readings that are constant and do not reflect any changes in the environment. Uh, we check for any missing values that is checking for the data completeness. As we may all know, this is important and may affect the outcomes or insight from analysis. Mm -hmm. And then also the timeliness, how fast are, do, are we able to get this data? So if our uh, our app refreshes the data, the data is refreshed hourly. So you need to make sure the data, at least when it's read between the time this data has been read and the time it is used on the platform, it should be within an hour. If it comes after that, then it may not be very useful for say like the mobile app. Next slide, please. 
Yes, yeah, so after the pre-processing, one of the main quality assurance procedures when working with low cost um, monitors, of course, is the field calibration. So of course, um, we know that the low cost monitors, when they have been deployed, can be affected by say temperature and humidity, which may either lead to them overestimating the value or underestimating the value. So calibration allows us to reduce that gap between the, the value that the low-cost monitor is reading and bring it closer to a value that, say, a reference-grade monitor would read if it were in the same location. We use machine learning to develop our calibration model for because it is um, for such a large network and the network across many countries, it may not be feasible to, to pick every each and every device and bring it back to the reference grade monitor. Remember, they are scarce on the continent, so that is not feasible. You needed we needed a method that allows us to calibrate these remotely, and machine learning allows us to do that. And also, if you move the devices to collocate them every time for calibration purposes, then you are affecting the data completeness in that area as well, because now you have to take it and collocate it for a while. It's no longer where it's supposed to be, so. Machine learning is became is like a, a to, um was the more convenient route for us to take. So to develop the machine learning model, we have two permanent colocation sites in Kampala. Um, okay, yeah, two permanent colocation sites where we collocate the reference grade monitor and then and several air core monitors that we use to, we use the data from this collocation sites to train our models and test the models as well. Mm -hmm. And we were able to achieve very good accuracy. I'm happy to share the details of the, the performance of the models maybe after, because I don't think it would be appropriate to share here. And then since we were looking at uh, using the same model to, calibrate monitors across different locations. We also had to do what we call the cross-unit and cross-site validations, uh, which of course also showed very good performance. We tested the, the models in different sites in Uganda, in Addis Ababa, and currently testing the model in Nairobi as well. And we have tested the model on air core devices and on purple air devices as well. So we are confident that we can reuse use the same model in several locations. Of course, for each city, we train the machine learning model with data from that city to improve like accuracy and all. Um, the graph, could you go back a bit? So maybe just to summarize what calibration does, if you look at the two graphs, the one on top is before calibration. Of course, you see there is a gap between what the measurements of the low cost monitor and that of the reference grade monitor. And after calibration, using the model that we developed, uh, you can see the, the difference is very small and usually large for when the values are very high. Next slide. Uh, so to summarize the, the field calibration pipeline, so we have a low cost sensor network the data from this network is streamed, of course, the low cost and uh, the reference grade monitor is streamed to our cloud platform where it goes through the data pre-processing and then stored um, stored for an hour. And this is because the reference grade monitor sends data hourly, that is the lowest resolution, but the, the low cost monitors send every 90 seconds but we are comparing this with reference grade monitor data. So we can only calibrate like the lowest resol resolution would be hourly. So we wait for at the end of the hour, we average the, the local sensor data to get an hourly average. And that is now what we calibrate. And then the calibrated data is what we share usually with the public or use for additional analysis. Yeah. Next slide. Um, so because of, uh, as you can see, the process I talked about, it's quite lengthy, like checking the device, uh, the pre-processing, developing the calibration model. You need a reference monitor for that. You need a machine learning engineer and ETC. It is quite costly in terms of time and resources. And we know that there is a number of smaller initiatives uh, 
that monitor air quality or individuals monitoring air quality on the continent that may not have these resources. So in order to make the calibration product available, we developed a usable uh, a user interface whereby a user is able to access the the calibration model by uploading the CSV on the platform. Could you just click the next button? I think that, yes. So you're able to upload your CSV with your raw data, that is the uncalibrated data. And then um, you list the, of course you, you select the columns on your CSV that correspond to the columns that are required here. And when you click calibrate, it downloads the, the final calibrated data. If you have access to collocate uh, data to a reference monitor that is collocated with your locus monitor, that's even better. You can train the model using your, your collocation data. And of course, the advantage of that is maybe a slight improvement in the accuracy. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so some of the, the things maybe to note from this work, so the quality assurance, as I mentioned, is a multi-step process. You start by looking at the device. If the device is giving you uh, garbage, then even when you, you get data that is very noisy and the all these uh, quality assurance processes after that, they may improve the quality of the data, but not to the extent to, to not comparable to when say you got data was data of better quality, right? Um, Limited access to reference grade monitors in other cities has also been a main hindrance for the work because uh, as of now, to the best of my knowledge, there is only one um, reference grade monitor that measures PM10, that, and that is the one for air core. So it's very difficult to test out the model for PM10 on, in, other, in other cities. Then, Intermittent internet and power supply affects data completeness, and we know that data completeness also affects the final results of the data. Of course, the solution to this, one of the solutions we've devised for this is the use of solar panels. Uh, meteorological data access has also been a challenge across Africa. Um, if you can see, like the process is automated, we need to get this data in a in a way that basically we need to use like an api in order to to meet the the time requirements between the the streaming the preprocessing the calibration and the display so if now i go and i have to collect data via csv it becomes a challenge i may not meet the timelines and yet one of the the service providers that can give us this data is tahmo uh, they have data across the continent but of course it's for paying after some point. So it also increases the cost of monitoring. And one of the solutions we are trying for this is to, to be able to measure ambient temperature and humidity. So incorporate these uh, sensors into our monitors so we can we can monitor these values ourselves. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes, so data integration. Um, as I mentioned, we have different different types. because the idea would be to, when you have data with better resolutions or maybe lower resolution, say minute by minute, you may be able to get some insights from, yeah, the, the, how the air quality varies within the different, I don't know, okay, like a better picture. But of course now when we average because the reference grade monitor is lowest resolution is hourly, then we may lose out on some information that could be vital for some tools. Um, then I've already talked about like the, the automated processes versus the manual processes. The manual processes of collecting data, I think the main challenge is the timeliness. Uh, it may not, we may not be able to collect process this data on time for what we need to use it for. And then the need for standardized formats. I think this is mostly a challenge when it comes to satellite data. For most of the data, at least we have used so far, 
you can either access them via API or CSV, which is very convenient to use, but with satellite data, it's quite different and requires some extra layer of pre-processing, which can be very time consuming. And that's it for me. Thank you for listening. I look forward to any questions. Thank you so much, Priscilla. This was fantastic. Uh, and there's several questions. So maybe I'll prioritize a couple for you right now. Um, one of which is if you could talk a little bit about the type of machine learning that you're using for calibration um, and you know how that process goes. Okay, so we use, I, I hope I understood the question. We used, uh, we tested several machine learning models, but the the best performing models were random forest for PM2.5 and lasso regression for PM10. Um, the details of the settings for the models and how we, the, the amount of data we used are available in a paper I'm happy to share because I'm not sure I can remember everything off head. I could share the link to the paper in the chat. Yes, that would be that would be great if you can do that. And I think another question, which is somewhat related, is on um, you know sensor purchase and then deployment. So, in case um, someone is purchasing a sensor from a supplier, do they need to calibrate the sensors before they get deployed in any location? So do you mean uh, when you're purchasing the sensor from Echo or any? I think this is from any, but perhaps if you talk about air quality sensors, that would give uh, Dr. Abulude, uh, you know, some insight on how best to plan for that. So I think the with air quality, usually we do the, the testing before, if you were to get the sensor, they'll probably have been tested, but it doesn't hurt to, to test them again elsewhere, I guess maybe say with a reference grade monitor, but before they leave the lab, they do go through all the tests that I talked about earlier. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Priscilla. And, and hang on, because we will probably come back to you with more questions. Uh, but for now, we'll move on to our final speaker for today, Dr. Augustine Ofulo, who is an Associate Professor of Environmental Health and really an expert in the topics related to air pollution um, and environment and health impacts. For over 20 years, he's been teaching, conducting research and mentoring students across Kenya, Botswana, and the US. And he is also one of the founding principal investigators of the GeoHealth Hub project in Eastern Africa. Um, mm -hmm. In the first phase, he uh, played a very active role and he's currently serving as a consultant on that project. And he's also um, published a variety of research papers and is a Fulbright Scholar in residence. So uh, Dr. Afula, the floor is yours, welcome. Thank you, Palavi, and uh, welcome uh, the other members on the, in, in, on, on the wall. Yeah, so just go to the, to the next slide. Those are just the basics. Yeah, just go to the next. Okay, so this is actually GeoHealth, uh, GeoHealth Hub. I'm actually starting from uh, uh, maybe Victor. I think uh, Victor. We we may have had the the longer version. I think we have the shorter version which we shared. I don't know, Victor. Victor, I think, uh, yeah, there, there is actually a longer version and a shorter version, but we can still go through this. Uh, this was a 23 page one, the slide one, but I shortened it to 15 slides. Uh, so we'll actually go through it, uh, starting with the, can I see the slide, particularly the one with the equipment? The one with the equipment, uh, Victor? Well, no, no webinar is complete without some technical issues. So um, we'll have the updated slides up shortly. 
Yeah, uh, essentially allotting him there. I think what, he, what, what has been projected is like an older version. There, is a, there was an updated one of uh, just around 15 slides. But I could still continue as we wait for that uh, projection to come in. We have uh, GeoHealth, uh, which is a global environmental and occupational health uh, network. It's actually having uh, five, five countries together, four in uh, the Eastern African uh, region and one in the US, of course, uh, being a partner kind of country. Uh, we have uh, Kenya, represented by the University of Nairobi. We have uh, Uganda, represented by Makerere University. In phase one, cycle one, we are actually into cycle, cycle two now, but in cycle one, we also had University of Rwanda, which was participating in the research act component. This phase, Rwanda is actually participating in the uh, capacity building component. Then we have, uh, of course, Addis Ababa, which is the regional kind of headquarters, uh, the suburb university. Uh, those are the partners. Of course, you also have the initial, it was University of Southern California, where Professor Kiros Perane was actually uh, the teaching. He has since moved to Colombia. He has still a strong partner. He's actually the lead uh, PI also in this one, alongside Professor Bera. Now, this, uh, this, this GeoHealth is actually very much hardware-based. It has got uh, maybe a, like, a, it's, it's, it's not been in the space for like 10 years because we first started around 2012 uh, where there was a, where there, there was what you call situation analysis. There was a planning phase for, yeah, I think that's the right one, you're right here. Yeah. So Victor, thanks for that. So this is actually, we are, I'm saying we are very much hardware based this is just a display of what we actually have on our site right now, the active site. We have on the left, the beta attenuation monitor, which is a gold standard monitor. You sometimes call it reference grade monitor, right on the left. Then in, in the middle, we have what we call the e-sampler, which is a low cost monitor. Uh, we actually have been collocating and we have used this for quite some time. We'll be able to see details as we move forward. The first two we have used for the last uh, like four years. We are into phase two, where are cycle two, where we have actually now gone into what we call the quant air low cost uh, sampler or sensor on the right hand side. Uh, the, 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 the bottom right is actually showing one mounted sort of uh, enlarged, but uh, bottom up, sorry, the, the, the right uh, up you are able to see right to the top, you are able to see like the wider global space with a number of those uh, uh, quant airs sort of uh, displayed in a place where they are still being tested next to a bomb. You are able to see the bomb, the, the what you call the beta intuition monitor 1022, the reference grade equipment, they are still being co-located before we can actually send them out to the, their various locations. So we are actually very much equipment and hardware best and we'll be able to see the reasons why as we move forward next next slide so as we go to the next slide we actually have what we call the global environmental and occupational health uh, basically i did mention that we have a long history uh, going back to 2012 up to 2014 when we had what we call the planning phase of geohealth in the planning phase, we had almost three key items that you are really considering. Actually, it was initially a long list. Like now we then zero down to three key ones, which is air pollution and health, occupational safety and health, and then climate change and health. We went through like a two year phase in which we are trying to identify what should our focus be. So looking through these three, we realized that the climate change largely occasioned by the gaseous pollutants really was heavy in terms of studies and in terms of data. Occupational safety and health, we integrated it, but midway, we realized that the key area was actually lack of data where we could actually relate air pollution and health. And zeroing down again to the air pollution, we, zero, we looked at the various possible air pollutants and we learned that 
the particulate matter was of more substance. It had got more serious impact on health because it digs deep into the alveoli and in the, it has got more serious health impacts, respiratory, cardiovascular, and related. The idea was that eventually it should be able to inform policy, uh, policy and have regulatory framework sort of generated out of this work. Uh, so 2012-2014, in the planning uh, phase, we did do the structural analysis report, which is actually available in our website. It's actually available for anybody to access. We, I, we actually did a very elaborate kind of uh, fact finding. We went to the various stakeholders, policymakers, academicians, and people in the practitioners in those two environmental and health and, and climate change kind of uh, space. And we did realize that uh, most of the data that was available, particularly the PM 2.5 related data, was actually very limited. Uh, most of the work was actually three to six months duration of uh, work, of collection. Three to six months, and they're actually largely collected by the low-cost uh, kind of uh, monitors. Uh, you are never sure of the quality, the calibration issues, uh, then, of course, for them to come out, you know, most of the time they're actually for thesis. And most of the time, again, as Dr. Mwaniki did mention earlier, academic line has got one serious limitation. They always look forward to publication. After the thesis is produced and they have qualified, they have got the academic qualification, it takes a bit of time again to have the, the, the papers peer reviewed and, of course, uh, published. We realize from that social analysis that it takes between three and eight years to have the publication, which means if it is done eight years after the work was done, the data more or less is stale. And even then, you know it is stale and is done by the low cost kind of monitor, which you are not sure whether it was even maybe what quality issues were really taken into account. So basically, we decided that we actually try to go a little bit deeper so that in the planning phase, we decided that it was important to have the low, low, low cost monitors because you know they are good in terms of they are affordable, you can have many, you can monitor many areas. But that aside, you can also, you also needed to have what you call a standard gold standard kind of equipment. And that's why we decided that we have parallel uh, e-sampler, 10 of them, plus also the BAM. And that has been able to help us walk through this space and as we planned, we also that knew that this data was supposed to be for policy. And we integrated the policy makers at the design stage, starting from the data collection when we formed, the, we had that situation analysis report. It was very much informed by the input from the policy makers. Along the way, even as we designed now the research, we actually had a number of them joining us in various phases. Kenya Meteorological Department, the National Environmental Management Authority, NEMA, the CAPS, uh, of course, also the Minister of Health, uh, the Environmental Health Research Department. And in fact, that's where uh, our colleague from uh, Kemri, uh, the name I'm forgetting, a professor from the from Kemri, our top uh, member in the network in Nairobi. So he was actually representing the the research wing of the health ministry. So that is how he started which means that for us, it was very clear from the word go that we needed data for policy making. So basically it was designed in a way that we, it was capital city based exposure assessment done by what we call the BAM 1022 gold standard monitor. Also we had a health effect assessment, mobility and mortality in 10 hospitals was planned, but eventually we zeroed down to like five to six. Uh, of course it was continuous data collection uh, then, of course, we also had in the design and uh, in, within the first cycle, uh, health effect assessment, where we did what we call the spirometry, lung function test in around 1,000 school-going kids aged between 9 and 12 years. And also in those same schools where these children were being uh, sort of uh, studied, uh, there was also what we call the e-sampler uh, equipment installed there so that we are able to see how to relate the, the, the spirometry readings and also the, 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 the prevailing kind of e-sampler readings, that's PM 2.5. Now, for, we, we actually plan to have 
an extension of this work, 30% of children's uh, homes were to be visited so that you have 30% of the studied 1,000 kids, then you would actually have what you call personal exposure assessment. This was to be in, in phases. It was to start from Addis Ababa, then going to Makerere, then it was supposed to come to Kenya. But by the time our, our program was coming to its uh, end of phase one, we were not able to have it coming to Kenya. So we didn't actually go into this 30%. Next slide. Next slide, please. So basically, therefore, our, our BAM has run continuously for three years from 10, uh, 9, 20, 2019 up to just this year, when we have actually had some kind of a temporary kind of breakage. The first time it's actually had even that break. For, so we are, we are actually happy that for continuous three years, we have had PM 2.5 measurements using reference monitor equipment more than three years. Uh, so we are actually trying the, in the process of trying to make the pump, the, the, fix the, look for the pump, and we'll be able to see along the way how this becomes a challenge in terms of data collection. We also have e-samplers, of course, the low-cost uh, sensors, currently five installed in some five schools. Uh, they have been running for the last four years, uh, very well kind of managed by a very competent team. And those, those, those are now the societies where they're actually based. Initially, there were 10, but over time, they have actually been sort of collapsing, collapsing over time. Maybe that's an area where we may want to interrogate further as a team. Because I also heard from uh, uh, Kanyiva, I think was it Kanyiva? Yeah, somebody mentioned that that problem of continuous. I think it was Anderson. Yeah, the breakdown of the equipment. Uh, so the about large over the three years, the BAM measurements have been on the on the range of around 18.9 per my uh, micrograms per meter cubed, and therefore we have been able to establish that this is much much above the uh, WHO levels of that's annual which is supposed to be just five. That is extremely high. These figures vary from season to season. Dry season is higher, wet season is a bit, little bit lower. But the e-samplers, which are also spread across the city, they read between 10 to 35, 10 being in the posh current sea areas, and also the 35 being on the James Gichuru area, which is just around the, the, the dumping site, the famous Vendora dumping site. Next slide. So, so, so you are able to see from there that the data from the BAM is now able to help us start what is called informing policy. Because when it came into this space, there was actually nothing that you could actually rely on. Then I did mention spirometry done in around uh, 1,000 kids. Uh, uh, grade five to six, age 12 to 13 years. Some were a little bit younger, but of course this, is, this was like 90% of the kids. Uh, now about 10% uh, of them had indications of impaired lung function. And when it comes to further kind of what you call hospitalization, stock mortality, stock morbidity data, which you're actually trying to capture from the health facilities, uh, Five health facilities we'll be able to see the list later. We have the, the lung heart related hospitalization being highest among under 15s, and also those aged 45 to 54. These are groups at risk in terms of the lung and heart related hospitalization. Mortality is highest among those aged 85 and above, with 3 to 7.4% on the heart side, that's a prevalence on the heart side, and two to three percentage prevalence pulmonary uh, side mortality. Can we go to the next? So this that was largely data from phase one. Now we are into phase two. Phase two, we are actually having two key themes: the lung function, which is done by all the countries, as I did mention, uh, the partner countries. Blood pressure is actually being done by Uganda, McLean University. Cognitive development is being done by Kenya. We are to start that in the coming year. 
the systems are being led right now. Then there's occupational heat stress, the one I mentioned earlier, where some 300 kids were to be exposed to, to we had to first check what you call the personal exposure, uh, tra tracking the PM where they actually operate from, especially at home. That is being done by Ethiopia. Then time series, that's hospital-based mortality and mo 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 mobility. That's continuous, the one we are collecting from the five to six hospitals. So this is the design for this second phase, this second cycle, uh, which I've just mentioned. But on top of that, capacity building is key for the geo health. We have, in this particular phase, we have PhD and MSc or MPH students also being trained. Part of our team has got actually a PhD student already ongoing, University of Nairobi, and an MPH student also ongoing, University of Nairobi. Those are part of our team. Now, so as we talk now, there's been some kind of progress in terms of partnership as we have, we have continued engaging. Air consensus, uh, we have been having some for the past 21 weeks. That is courtesy of our partnership with Airco. You just had uh, one of our colleagues, Airco colleagues talking. Yeah, we have some of their sensors and we have had their data for the last 21 weeks. They are located in a number of locations as maybe listed. And then they were taken to the schools that were initially having e samplers, which broke down. I did mention initially we had 10 e samplers in the different schools and one co located e sampler with the BAM. So we had to keep sort of playing around a bit just to be able to, 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 to be sure that we are able to capture as much data as we can. So in locations where we had e samplers breaking down, when AirCo came up, we were able to sort of agree on an arrangement. So our, our stance, where we are having the e samplers actually where the airco has actually uh, fitted their equipment on a kind of a partnership. The, uh, the, the, the e samplers were using the solar, the airco are also using solar, but of course now the BAM is using the national power grid. Now, as we talk now for this current phase, this phase where they cycle two of GeoHealth across all the countries in, uh, that are in this uh, work, there are 11 air quant air sensors. That's the local sensors that are actually replacing the e samplers in this phase. Currently co-located at the University of Nairobi Parklands campus. That's where our base is. Now they'll be running for 10 weeks. We are actually having making arrangements to have them actually taken to the various locations. Part of the reason we have actually delayed in taking them to the various locations is because the BAM, which was supposed to be like helping us in the local collocation actually came down. I did mention that the pump is actually, we are actually procuring the pump and we hope that before we take them out, we'll have had some short period of sort of collocation with the BAM. So for the health facilities, which we have been collecting data from, that is the mortality and mobility data, uh, cardiovascular and related. We have Mbagathi, Aga Khan, Nairobi Hospital, Mama Lucy and Mata Hospitals. Uh, so we have had 46 months of data from these facilities. Of course, as one of us did mention earlier, all these facilities have got data in hard copy. So basically, and, and of course, all the different kind of causes of the deaths and causes of the diseases, the reasons for uh, the admission, they are all in hard copy. So we have been trying to sort of go through this and then start selecting what is relevant and of course, putting them in soft copy and we are actually at the, some, 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 some of the areas are a bit slow, like Nairobi Hospital, it's a bit slow because there have been ups and downs. Partnership at times is a bit of a challenge, but we keep coping, we keep looking for how to work out those challenges and moving on. Uh, so, this, uh, the, the, so this has been cycle one. So cycle two, this aspect continues. So partnership opportunities do exist. So of course, we have, been, we have had some already, but already something is something that already we open our, our, our open arms for other people to come in and we work together. Uh, we have signed them or use with partners and the share data with them, including NEMA, which is, of course, a very key policy maker. Uh, say, then there's a PhD student from the University of Nairobi that uh, has also been able to benefit from our data. 
Our team got an opportunity to showcase their work during the upcoming agricultural show. They are, they are actually in the process of preparing, so we have been actually trying to put together what we did need to show there so that we are able to reach the public with the, what we are doing and our data. Uh, so it's possible to get real-time data from the AIRCO and quant a AQ sensors as we talk now. It's only that, of course, the particularly the quant AQ sensors are only in one site for now. Of course, I did mention why they have delayed, but we are actually going to be taking them out to the various sub-cities in Nairobi County. Uh, one just need, requires an internet, uh, and then, of course, you have the data. But BAM requires manual download. Next slide. OK, so uh, gaps or areas for further partnership. Going by our many years now of experience in this space, uh, getting spare purpose, purpose for the sensor is a challenge. I did just mention the BAM down for the first time. Then the last almost two months, you have not had data. And we must ship these things from particular days because you know BAM is a US grade kind of uh, gold equipment, gold standard equipment. So basically, uh, we are losing a lot of data in that process. So two months, you know, is a long time. A local manufacturer perhaps should consider venturing into this. And that's an area where I think uh, maybe the private sector also partnership comes in. Co-location partnership. We are making all attempts to bring the BAM back to life because, you know, being a gold standard equipment, it helps in terms of data quality. When a co-location is done, it's a very important aspect of data management. We are open for co-location. Uh, any other entities that uh, once we, we are, our BAM is up again, we are actually open for for co-location partnership. Now, so some of the things that you have actually been able to do over the period, I did mention that you have been in this phase for some time. After our, uh, to ascend of our first phase of the research, you were able to have some kind of awareness workshop, which had a lot of stakeholders from all sectors of the society. And that's the link, maybe you are able to access it. This was in January, 2022. We have had what you call a policy brief. It's also, I think you can actually pick it from this point. If it's not difficult, if it's not possible, I can share it using other means. Uh, there has also been a policy brief number two, which I was not able to have in time to fix here, but it's also available. We can share it. Uh, it's actually for, for public use. Uh, so of course, I also did mention that we did situation analysis at the beginning, and that was very important in informing really all that we are doing. And really to the best of our knowledge, we have really helped fill a very major research data gap, particularly where PM 2.5 is concerned. That's the one which has got a most significant impact on health. Otherwise, I wish to acknowledge my colleagues. Uh, of course, my PI is Professor Nicholas Oguge, Professor Stephen Obiero, co-investigator. Lydia Okola is our program administrator, Joshua Noah and Belden are research assistants. They really do a lot of work in this geohealth. They really have a lot of knowledge. Uh, then, of course, NIH is our funding agency. But in phase one, also, we had almost 20% of the funding done by IDRC. Uh, of course, can't forget Professor Kiros Berane, right now, University of Columbia, formerly uh, USC, University of Southern California. We also have Professor Abira Kumi from uh, the Sova University, who is the regional PI. I did mention that the Sababa is the regional headquarter of the GeoHealth uh, East Africa Network. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that has been uh, informative. Thank you so much, Dr. Afulo. I think this was uh, really fantastic and also ties into the next webinar that we will be doing in the month of October. I know that we are already over time, so um, maybe I'll just go with a couple of quick questions that came up for you. Um, one of which was that you mentioned using solar panels for um, the sensors that you were deploying, and um, Dr. Abalude is interested in understanding what is the durability of the solar panels and how long are you able to use them to run the air quality monitors. Hey, thanks. I think that's a very, a very good question. Now, since we installed the the, the e samplers 
20, actually we installed them early 20, uh, 2019, actually late 2019, 2018, started working around 2019. So they've been working through the entire period. So all the six points where the e samplers are working, the solar panels never failed. What failed are the equipment. So they really have got reasonable lifespan. The equipment, I think, they are meant to be like uh, operate within like three, four years, particularly the low cost sensors, the e samplers we're using. But the solar panel has been perfect. And we are happy to report that even uh, the, the quant. Uh, no, the, 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 uh, the, the, our partner who has actually used part of our system is also actually having the solar. And so far, there is no report of any challenge with the solar. Okay, hey, um, fantastic. I think in the interest of time, we will probably close uh, today's session, but this has been really informative. Uh, and we are really viewing this as a longer conversation. So please do join us in October. Uh, when we continue the discussion. Um, and I would now like to thank all of the speakers and request my colleague, Victor, to close today's session. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Pallavi. And uh, on behalf of HEI, I would like to thank our co-chairs and speakers for really finding time to share their insights with us uh, for this time. Um, I would also like to acknowledge uh, HEI staff uh, who worked on this uh, webinar series behind the scenes. Thank you very much. Um, as we said at the start, this is the first of a series of webinars. Um, we have uh, one on October 23rd, uh, 25th, 2023 uh, on capacity building in East Africa. So please do join us for, for that in a month's time. Uh, we have a November session and a January session coming up as well. Um, I would also like to acknowledge um, Deo Okure and Gideon Lubi both of ECO, uh, Ivy Murko, uh, WRI Africa, who really helped us to shape the agenda for today's session. And for colleagues in Nairobi, this is the beginning of a conversation that we're going to be having for the rest of the week. Uh, so for those of us, for those of you who are joining us in Ivasha tomorrow, we'll have a two-day session on data access and quality assurance um, within the Nairobi network. So I hope to see you there as well. So thank you very much and uh, do have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you.